ladies and gentlemen, Gary Moore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill Wendell. Hi, friend. One of the most popular pageants in American history now is the Miss America Teenage Pageant. We seldom get a chance to see Miss Teenage America up as close as we'd like or to hear from her. But that's going to be our privilege in just a few minutes because she is going to be our first contestant here on the Tell the Truth as soon as we say hello to our teenage panel here on the Tell the Truth. Jack Cassidy. Peggy Cass. Orson Bean. And Kitty Carlisle. Do you all watch beauty, beauty pageants on, on television? Oh, yeah. Every morning when I shave. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. We have with us, right at this very moment, behind that curtain, and here we go, Miss Teen Age America. <laughs> Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Melissa Galbraith. Number two. My name is Melissa Galbraith. Number three. My name is Melissa Galbraith. Now, only one of these, of course, is the real Miss Teenage America. The other two ain't chopped liver, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but here is the story. It goes like this. I, Melissa Galbraith, hold the title of Miss Teenage America. This annual contest is in no sense a beauty contest. One is judged strictly on the basis of scholastic achievement and awareness, talent, poise, and appearance. Initially, girls from 13 to 18 years of age compete in local pageants or they enter the National Candidate at Large program. At the finals, most of the judges are former teenage American contestants. Winning the coveted award entitles me to a year of travel, shares of stock in American industry, and a four-year $10,000 scholarship to the college of my choice. Signed, Melissa Galbraith. <laughs> and while we sit and look at these pretty young things, we've got some pretty commercials for you to look at, but you'll join us again in a moment, won't you? We have three absolutely charming young gals over here. They all say that they are Melissa Galbraith, who proudly holds the title of Miss Teenage America. We'll start uh, the question with a man who I believe has a teenage son of his own, Mr. Jack Cassidy. Thank you, Gary. Well, he's practically in his teens. Um, number three, uh, where was uh, the contest held that you won in your local area? It was held, well, I, there wasn't one in my local area. I entered the candidate at large program. Oh, you didn't have to win any uh, preliminary contest? Not a contest, no. I see. Number two, um, uh, how, don't you, do you not think it's unfair that the, the age bracket is from 13 to 18? Don't you feel you're competing with larger ladies? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair. You do. Number one, you agree? Yes. Well, you're all going to say that. Of course <laughs> you are. Thank you, Jack, Peggy. I know Number nothing. three, what qualifications do you have to have to be a candidate at large? You just kind of, I mean, the whole world could enter. Well, they're the same, the same qualities that everyone else has. It's just that you do it by mail. Oh, I see. Number two, what kind of marks did you have in school? If scholastic achievement counts, you must be pretty good. Yes, you must maintain a very, fairly high average. Like what? What would be the average? Um, A minus, B plus. Thank you. Uh, number one, where are you from? Clarion, Pennsylvania. Where? Clarion. Clarion, Pennsylvania. And number three, where are you from? Cottage Grove, Oregon. And number two, where are you from? Lorraine, Ohio. Ah, uh, girls from big metropolises, I see. <laughs> Number one, it says here that you're going to get 10,000, some, a lot of money, uh, shares of stock in American industry. Do they pick the stocks or do you? They pick the stocks. And they pick, I suppose, conservative. 
Uh, uh, and that buzzer takes us on to Mr. Bean. Yes, yeah, since the advent, uh, I'll ask this is number three of, of uh, the girls having to have a skill such as demonstrations of handicrafts, crocheted bas-reliefs of David Cassidy for use as <laughs> placemats, things like that. Did you have the skill beforehand that you had, or did you dream one up when you wanted to get into the contest? No, I had, well, you know, I sing and play the guitar. Oh, and yeah. I've, I've done that for number about one. five years. Yeah, all right, number one, did you do whatever you do? Yes, our school had the play Fiddler on the Roof, and I sang a medley of songs from Fiddler on the Roof. Ah, number two, what's the women's lib position on beauty contests, or beauty and or talent contests? Do you happen to know? No, I don't. What's your position on women's lib, number two? Um, Just I don't, interested. It has nothing to do with the spot. I don't like, I don't agree with it. Uh, Some of the things. Russia. And we're going to go with Kitty Carlisle. Thank you. Number three, what did you have to wear? Well, these outfits that we're wearing, we wore during the, the pageant. Thank you. Number two, how did you get to the finals? You have to um, go undergo um, examination, and then you, the um, eight finalists are picked at a convention center. Thank you. Number one, where is the convention center? It's in Fort Worth, Texas. And number three, when you traveled for that year, who chaperoned you? My mother. And uh, number one, did you, were you allowed to wear makeup for the finals? You were allowed to wear it, but it was stressed to look as natural as possible. And number two, what did you wear? Did I wear makeup? Yeah. Yes, I did, just a little bit. And number three, where did you travel during that year? Well, I haven't traveled yet. Oh, you just no. got it? Yeah. Oh, I see. Number two, who financed this? It was sponsored by... It was sponsored by the Ding Dong Company. <laughs> and we're going down to Jack Cassidy. <laughs> yes, well, I... Uh, What's the matter? Oh. I'm hurriedly writing... No, it's... Uh, uh, matter of fact, I, I, I've loused things up here because I forgot to say we've got to take a look over here while you all give you a chance to mark oh, your ballot. It's only fair. So the audience and I'll take a look again at number one. That's number two. And at number two. And at number three. And by now, we've had a chance to make up our minds. And so, Jack, you start your vote. Well, I wrote, I wrote down number one, which means I voted for number one, evidently. I voted for number one. Uh, I like the way the lady is sitting. She looks like she's... <laughs> She's been sitting on, waiting on tender hooks <laughs> for David's address. It'll do Go it ahead. to you. Oh, we've got a one going, Peggy. Well, I think you're really all adorable, but number one looks like a contest winner to me, so I voted for her, too. And besides, she comes from Ohio. Well, lots of pretty girls in Ohio. That's quite true. Winners. No, she doesn't. She comes from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> but a lot of pretty oh, well. girls come from Sorry, Ohio. Number two. We got a pair of ones in Orson. Indeed, number one does come from Pennsylvania, the state that produces the most beautiful women in the world. My, My wife. wife, for instance. Your My wife. wife. Yes. However, I was forced to vote for number three because there's something about her. <laughs> that just on yeah, it's a, a hunch. All righty, so there you go. And Kitty, how are you coming? Well, that's interesting. I voted for number two because I think Ohio produces presidents and pretty girls, and I think it's she. Well, we got them all up and down here. Somebody's got to be right, somebody's got to be wrong. Well, the real Melissa Galbraith, Miss Teenage America, please stand up. There you go, <laughs> Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Number two, pull into your microphone and tell us about yourself. Tell us what your name is and like My that. My real name is Ann Gannon. I'm a sophomore at Bronxville High School in Bronxville, New York. Hey, nice job. <laughs> and number three? My name is Lisa Edmondson. I'm a senior at the Convent of the Sacred Heart in New York City. Oh. Melissa, you said that you got a $10,000 scholarship to right. the college of your choice. I think right. we should make it clear that obviously you first then have to qualify for right. the college, right? You have to be accepted. Right. You can't just go up to the college and say, I got 10000 bucks, I want in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Melissa, good luck to you, my dear. Thank you very much. And thank you, gals. Keep going. Well, that was a happy spot. Three more outgoing young people you'll never meet, but uh, as a tremendous change of pace, there does seem to be an enormous amount of pressure on young people today, and one of the sad byproducts is a rising adolescent suicide rate. Now, in a couple of minutes, we will meet a psychologist who has made a study of why this is and perhaps what can be done about it. But first, a brief intermission. Now, let's meet our psychologist. Ba, 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 
Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Pamela Cantor. Number two. My name is Pamela Cantor. Number three. My name is Pamela Cantor. And here is the affidavit of Pamela Cantor. It says, I, Pamela Cantor, am a psychologist specializing in the subject of adolescent suicide. In the last few years, there has been a rising rate of suicides in this country for the under 21-year-old group. There is a strong difference in suicide attempts of boys and girls. More is demanded of a male, so a boy who doubts himself and his abilities in any area is the one who will try to kill himself. On the other hand, a girl is more likely to use a suicide attempt as a cry for help or a plea for love. Boys are also more serious about their attempts and more likely to succeed. And so the fact is that although nine out of 10 suicide attempts are girls, three out of every four who succeed are boys. Signed, Dr. Pamela Cantor. And doctors Cantor, one, two, and three, I will turn you over to Kitty Carlisle. Thank you. Uh, number three, uh, do you feel that this rise in suicide rate is drug-related? No, I don't. Uh, number two, if you're doing work in this subject, it would be very helpful to know how one can allay the fears and doubts of a, of a young boy as a parent. I think, first of all, that you have to listen to him as, as much as you possibly can, and you also have to teach him how to express his doubts. You have to teach him how to cry, in other words. Number one, do you agree with that? Yes. Is there anything else you can do? Well, keeping open the lines of communication is everything. Yeah, well, thank you. Number three, how do you, how do you encourage a boy to feel more self-confident when there are perhaps realistic reasons why he should doubt himself? I suspect that if there are realistic reasons why an individual should doubt himself, he will get that from others. You as the family members, as the parent, have to instill the self-confidence from very early infancy. Thank you, Kitty. Let's go on Jack Cassidy. Yes, uh, Doctor, number two. Uh, <coughs> most recently, there's been a minister who supports uh, the theory that suicide should be organized or contained. Do you know the name of the minister, number two? No, I really don't. Number three? I'm sorry. No, I don't. Number one? I'm sorry. Um, well, he's in trouble, and so am I. <laughs> number, number one, uh, what's, what country has the largest uh, percentage of suicides in the world? Well, Sweden does, statistically, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, number three, can you detect a suicidal, uh, the tendency for suicide in, in someone above the age of seven, for instance? Uh, there are signs that one might look for, if that's what you mean, but we really don't know what characteristics predispose one towards suicide. Uh-huh. Um, thank you. Thank you. And let's take a, uh, let's go to Peggy, please. Thank you. Number one, at how early an age do children, I mean, what is the earliest that children even contemplate suicide? There have been suicides under the age of eight, although they're not statistically reported to the government. Any suicide happening under that age is reported uh, as a death by another cause, but we know it because notes have been left. Thank you. Number two, do they prosecute people who try to kill themselves and, uh, and do not succeed? I think that depends upon the state you're talking about. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know about that, uh, the answer at all. Do, in other words, there are some, some states that do have prosecution. Thank yes. you. Well, number one, after all, not every kid is going to be a great basketball player or a great brain. I mean, most people are just average, so why do they expect, why do they expect more of themselves than they can actually do? It stems from feelings of worthlessness, basically. Is that uh, because they're not on the same level as the top guy? I some mean, of, I can't say this, we don't know. Well, I mean, why would somebody feel worthless? I mean, you can look around, a lot of people less more worthless than you are. Yes, but uh, <laughs> their parents may not have thought so. Oh, you mean the parents will make them, try to make them overachievers? Okay, Peggy, thank you, and we're gonna go to Orson for the last one. Yeah, let me ask this of number two. I, I find it strange that in an age when there seems to be less pressure on a young boy to achieve than ever before, the, the new age of consciousness three and the greening of America, there's a rise in suicide rates of young people. I don't find that strange at all, neither do any of my colleagues. I think when you find more permissiveness, um, it puts more pressure on the individual to perform by his peers. 
as well as by his parents. Well, number two, number three, if the peers are so-called dropouts, which is the old people's complaint about the young people, mm -hmm. Why is the rising suicide rate attributable to pressures to succeed? Uh, I think there are pressures to succeed by various means. It's by whose standards are you referring to? By the parents' standards, succeed in the sense of uh, achieving or succeed in the sense of sexual conquests because of the new liberation? Mm. And on that note, we must consult within ourselves and come up with a number, which we put on a ballot, and that number must be a one, or a two, or a three. This one's tough. Kitty, have you marked your ballot? Well, I voted for number three. I wish she hadn't mentioned sexual conquest at the very end, because that mixed me up. <laughs> I was going to congratulate her, because I think that she's right, that the parents must give a child a feeling of self-confidence and, and lack of self-doubt early on. And I think that's a good thing to have said. Thank you, number three. We've got a three showing. Jack Cassidy coming on. Well, I felt number three also, but except uh, I liked number one's answers. Uh, actually, all three of the ladies are, are very, uh, very bright and very hip to the subject. But on a hunch, you go for one. I do. Peggy. Well, gee, I don't think parents give a rap about your sexual conquest. They don't want you to have them at all. So, you know, I they're, voted for number one. Cheering, they're cheering for your defeat. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Knock it off. A pair of ones and a three in Orson. My boy is doing very badly after school. I'm very worried about I voted for number three, uh, however. Uh, it could be in any of the three of them. There are two good liars. I'm well, we got a pair of bookends. Maybe We've three, got them uh, on both ends. And let's see how it goes here. The votes are all in with the real Dr. Pamela Cantor. Please stand up. Look at that. <laughs> In a moment, we're going to turn Dr. Cantor over to our studio audience, but first we want to find out who our contestants, who our imposters were. Number one, what is your real name, please, and what do you do? My name is Irene Silverman. I'm a housewife and the author of a book on working women, nine to five and after. Here you did. <laughs> Number two, I take my problems to you. What is your real name? What do you do? My real name is Angeline Forbes, and I play electric bass with a brand new rock group called Meadow. How about that? <laughs> well, we thought that this was a subject that our studio audience might want to kick around, and having an expert as, at hand, such as Dr. Cantor, Bill Wendell is out in the audience, and Bill, uh, do you have you have a lady there? Yes, I do. Gary, uh, your name and where you're from, please. Mary Cosser from Stoneham, Massachusetts. And your question for the doctor. My question is, is it because parents don't find enough time to love their children that they feel unwanted and well, they think about suicide? When you're, you're mentioning two things, is that the parents don't find enough time to spend with their children, I believe that that's often the case, particularly with regard to fathers. Is it that they don't love their children, they may love their children as much as they're capable of loving, uh, it's a matter of communicating these wishes to the child, these feelings to the child. It's not a matter of how much love you actually give, but how the child perceives that love, whether it seems sufficient to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have a gentleman over here. Your name? Where are you from? John Lemus, New Bedford, Mass. Your question. My question, doctor, has drugs got a lot to do with so many suicides? There really is very little evidence to indicate that drugs are related to suicides. Some types of drugs, such as hallucinogenic drugs, LSD, may act as a catalyst to underlying problems. However, they don't cause the problems themselves. They are a way of dealing with the problems. Other drugs, such as hard drugs like heroin, are indirectly, if not directly, a method of suicide. Thank you. One more down here, Gary. Would you sure. stand, please? Your name, where are you from? Uh, Mary Terrell, Detroit, Michigan. Your question. Uh, my question is, does adolescent suicide come from broken homes? There is a great deal of evidence to indicate that many problem behaviors are the result of broken homes. There's a correlation between them. Um, there is no information that indicates that broken homes, per se, cause suicide. They contribute problems to any, any child. Thank you. 
Thank you, Bill. I've saved uh, a little time for one more question for me, uh, Dr. Cantor. Uh, is it possible, you know, now they start, kids start testing for, for colleges and schools way earlier than they did in my day. Is it because we have somehow robbed them of their adolescence? We're trying to make grown-ups of them too fast? We've hit upon a very important point. We've extended adolescence past the psychiatric definition, which is ages 11 to 21. Mm -hmm. We have furthered education to the point that individuals have to stay in school until they're almost 30. We have delayed marriages and possibilities for commitments. This seems to me, this protracted adolescence, puts undue pressures on an individual who can't actually go out and deal with the capacities that he has. He's kept as a child. In addition to this, we um, the increasing rate among adolescent suicide has to do with the lack of family ties. We ah. seem to be stressing mobility rather than stressing uh, family unity. It would and seem it, that so many of our problems come from the falling apart of the family structure as, right. as mankind has known it over centuries. As we become over technological, I'd say, as we, be, <clears throat> as we start stressing independence for youth and mobility for youth as a sign of manhood, as a sign of adulthood, rather than stressing the, the ability to accept parents and maintain a unity with the family. This seems to me a greater sign of maturity than having to run away to prove independence. Thank you, Dr. Cantor, and thank you, imposters, also, for being here. Thank you. I, I, I know, but we're up to our eyeballs in discussion over, over here. We've got a whole clinic of our own going here as to what's causing this whole thing. It's been fascinating being with you, friends, all this week. I want to thank Jack Cassidy. I want to thank Orson Bean. And, of course, Miss well, Big and Miss Kitty. See you tomorrow, though, Gary. What? Huh? See you tomorrow. Well, I'm coming. I don't care. If you, <laughs> if you tune your set in and I'm not there, that's not my fault, because I'm going to be here. Get that Neiman Marcus Watch football. <laughs> yeah, we'll get the Neiman Marcus coming, and you won't be able to tell the difference. Our central characters today will receive the lovely dress from Soubrette, the house of many moves. Soubrette, dresses and ensembles that create excitement and fit to perfection. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels, the nation's largest chain of 1,200 fine owner operated motels in 900 cities from coast to coast. Mr. Roper needs to compete. Mr. Howell needs to taunt. Come on. And some stars need to take a deep breath. I'm going to pass out it. The feuding in Hollywood just got a lot more interesting. So let the finger pointing begin as your favorite stars don their battle attire for Celebrity Family Feud. And it's Richard's job to make sure everyone plays nice. Excuse us. Oh. <laughs> Watch Celebrity Family Feud weeknights at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific, only on Game Show Network.